Hi, <clears throat> can you hear me? So my name is Peng Peng. I'm the uh, chair for this session. We have a few minutes. Does anybody want to test the share screen function? Yeah, can I please try? Yep, go ahead. Thanks. Can you see my screen? Uh, it's starting. Yeah, I can see it. Oh, so it works. That's great, thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I'm gonna unshare it. So. Okay. Are you the first talk? Uh, I think I'm the second one. Okay. okay. Is the speaker of the first talk here already? Huh. I also don't have his recording. Hello, so uh, I guess it's the time to start. Can you hear me well? Well, yes. Good. So my name is Peng Peng. I'm a faculty at Michigan State University in the physics department. So I will be chairing this session today. Uh, I think we have over 10 talks, um, some contributing talks, some invited talks. Uh, so I was advised that we should uh, strictly uh, follow the schedule. So I will give you a sign when you are uh, approaching to the time limit. So I guess the first talk is from Gauren, um, but uh, I don't see the speaker here. Uh, I don't know how to uh, move forward because I don't have uh, the recording yet. So Tian. Uh, uh, enter yes. the window, meet. So let me see. Let's just wait a couple of minutes. Um, I know you will be helping me in this uh, coordination. Uh, um, so how we do this case? Okay. Uh, you you are saying you don't have the videos? The, yeah, I don't have the recording. Okay. Uh, I, have, I don't have every recording. I have a few, but unfortunately, the first speaker. Okay, I, uh, I have it. I can play it. Okay, maybe you can share it. Okay, okay. The title for his talk is Homogeneity Region of Palladium Oxide Nanocrystalline okay, Film okay, um, to Get Sensors. Uh, 
Oh, I, I also don't think I have it. Yeah, that was not on the link that we can download. Oh, yeah. So for whom who just entered the room, uh, the first speaker of the session did not show up and we don't have the recording either. Uh, Do you think we should move forward? I think we are out of the schedule. <laughs> Uh, I guess I guess we just wait. We his talk is supposed to be ten minutes. Let's okay. wait to even. The second talk, the speaker is here, right? Olga? Yeah, I think so. She is here. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. And how about the third speaker, George? Not here? I have the recording. So for those who just joined, uh, I'm the session chair for this, uh, for this session, uh, but we are missing the first speaker. We don't have the presentation recording either. So we will wait to uh, 11, 10 to directly start the second talk. If you would like to test the share screen function, you can go ahead.
Okay, so I guess we can start. I will introduce myself again. So my name is Peng Peng Zhang. I'm a faculty in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Michigan State University. I will be the session chair today. So uh, again, we missed the uh, first speaker in the first talk. So let's start from the second talk. Uh, the title of the talk is Design of Water Soluble Fullerene Derivatives with Promising Antiviral Properties. The speaker is Alga. Please go ahead. Thank you very much for you the introduction. Yeah. 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 Well, can you see my screen? I can see your screen and I will give uh, you an indication when you're close to the uh, time limit. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon or good evening, dear colleagues. My talk, my talk is about the design of photosoluble fullerene derivatives with promising antiviral properties. Uh, so fullerenes and their derivatives are widely known for their promising antiviral, anti-tumor, antioxidant uh, activity, and other types of biological activities. And non-modified fullerene uh, is a very hydrophobic compound, which limits its application in medicine. Um, the synthesis of uh, water-soluble fullerene derivatives still represents a big challenge. And the method for the synthesis of water-soluble fullerene derivatives, uh, which are developed in our lab, are based on the reactions of easily accessible uh, chlorofullerenes such as, for example, C60-chlorine-6 or C70-chlorine-8 with various uh, nucleophiles. And um, friedel crafts a relation of C60-chlorine-6 uh, with various aromatic esters is one of the most promising methods because it allows to obtain um, compounds with carbon-carbon bonds between the fullerene cage and uh, solubilizing addend. Um, well, um, typically this reaction allows to obtain uh, compounds with five aromatic addends, uh, and one chlorine atom attached to the uh, fullerene cage. Um, further hydrolysis of the ester groups in fullerene derivatives allows to obtain uh, polycarboxylic fullerene-based uh, acids, and potassium salts of these acids are highly uh, soluble in water. Well, the modified version of uh, this method is based on the reactions, on the direct reactions of C60-chlorine-6 or C70-chlorine-8 uh, with various uh, aromatic um, acids, and this method allows to obtain previously inaccessible compounds with, for example, residues of um, aromatic amides of amino acids with very high yields and uh, without time and solvent consuming chromatographic purification. Uh, well, uh, the profile of biological activity of uh, fullerene derivatives, uh, pentad-related fullerene derivatives, depends uh, dramatically on the type of um, the sixth atom attached to the fullerene cage. For example, we can change uh, like a profile of biological activity uh, simply um, substitute, substituting a chlorine atom with hydrogen atom. And in the attempt to uh, substitute chlorine atom with, with phosphonate residue using classical Arbuzov reaction, um, we observed very uh, untypical transformation um, which allowed to obtain us uh, fullerene derivatives with five aromatic addons and while well, one alkyl radical attached to the cage. And uh, these compounds uh, demonstrated very interesting biological properties, as I will show on, shown on my uh, next slides. Well, uh, also substitution of the chlorine atom to the residue of, of typhon derivative um, allowed to obtain uh, C1 symmetrical, also previously unknown, um, fullerene derivatives with two types of aromatic addons. Uh, all synthesized compounds were uh, thoroughly characterized with uh, NMR experiments and also um, mass spectrometry. As I mentioned briefly previously, water-soluble fullerenes are known for their antiviral properties and also anti-tumor, antioxidant, uh, anti-amyloid, and neuroprotective activity. They are also used uh, as contrast agents for MRI and compounds for the formation of drug delivery vesicles. Uh, the uh, biological activity of our compounds were investigated by our colleagues um, in um, uh, Gamaleya Institute and Research Center for Medical Gen Genetics in Moscow, also Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium and National Taiwan University. And to compare uh, antiviral activity uh, of our water-soluble fluorine derivatives, we used three parameters. Uh, EC50, which is the effective concentration, is the concentration uh, of compound that by 50% inhibits the cytopathogenic effect of compound of virus for cells. Uh, also, cyto cytotoxic concentration CC50, which is the concentration that by 50% reduces uh, the cell viability, and selectivity index, which is CC50 divided by EC50. And uh, typically at this stage, if you have a selectivity index of 100 and more, uh, we can consider our compound as promising um, antiviral anti drug for further studies. Uh, so for our most promising compounds, um, 
we obtained um, selectivity indexes of values from 200 up to 40,000 against uh, Cetimilgo virus, herpes simplex virus, human immune deficiency virus, and also influenza virus, which means that uh, these compounds were comparable or even more effective than um, commonly used uh, antiviral drugs. Uh, so we also demonstrated that uh, even slight chemical modification uh, in the structure of uh, the full urine derivative can uh, influence its effects for human lung fibroblast fibroblasts. For example, a compound with the chlorine atom attached to the cage uh, caused uh, DNA damage and induced apoptosis uh, in the cells, while the compound with methyl radical and the same aromatic cadence uh, was, uh, on the contrary, uh, inhibitor of the apoptosis. Uh, also, our colleagues uh, demonstrated that uh, tyrosine-based water-soluble food and derivatives um, in effectively inhibited uh, carcinoma vi viability of carcinoma cell lines of three different types of carcinoma cell lines. Um, we also studied the acute toxicity of um, the most promising water-soluble food and derivative, uh, which demonstrated selectivity indexes of more than 40,000. Uh, against hum uh, herpes simplex virus. And uh, we demonstrated that acute toxicity of this compound was uh, actually comparable to the acute toxicity of uh, the aspirin. Uh, so L LD100 for this compound was about 600 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, thus, uh, this means that our compounds demonstrated uh, low acute toxicity, low cytotoxicity together with um, a very high antiviral activity and promising also anti-tumor properties, which makes them uh, promising candidates for the development of fullerene-based uh, drugs. So that's all. I would like to thank my supervisor and my colleagues and financial agencies for the, for, for the support and you for your kind attention. Thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, is there any questions from the audience? You finished pretty early. <laughs> so we have a few, few more minutes. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions, you can enter on the chat panel. I also okay. heard that you can use the app to ask questions directly to the speaker. Uh, so if you've got any questions, Olga, you will receive the emails. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. Thank you. So now the next speaker is uh, George. Are you there? Do we have the speaker from the third talk? The next talk is about two-dimensional metal organic frameworks, the promising candidates for emerging 2D materials. Uh, is the speaker here? And this is also the talk that didn't really upload the recording. Tian, did you see that? Yeah, uh, I also don't have it.
So sorry, everybody, for waiting. Uh, so it looks like the third speaker is not showing up, and we don't have his or her recording for the presentation. Uh, so we have to pause for another 10 minutes. And I know the uh, the talk for the fourth uh, presentation, uh, the presenter is here. Uh, so that's great. Uh, so let's pause for 10 minutes. If you want to, Xiaodong, if you want to test uh, the screen sharing, you can go ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Share the screen. Yeah, you sh you should already have this uh, permission, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, very good. Uh, I can talk for thirty minutes. Am I right? Yeah. So uh, I guess we. Uh, so so let's 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 not go ahead right now. Let's wait for ten minutes. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah, so we can follow this video. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, the title of my talk is Meso Entropy Cover. This is a quite uh, new name. Uh, I named the carbon with entropy. Uh, oh, so we have some echo from your microphone. Is I, I hear the echo. The microphone. So it's just me or everybody else have the same problem. Um, I hear the, the signal is not great. Yeah, okay. I believe the speaker just entered. Uh, George, are you there? Can you hear me? The speaker for the third talk just entered the room. Hello, George. Hey, uh, can you share your screen? This is, I, I think you are the speaker for the third presentation, right? That starts from 11, 20, oh, 8, 20. Yeah, okay, so you can share your screen. So the third talk is about two-dimensional metal organic frameworks, uh, the emerging 2D materials. Uh, please go ahead, thank you. We can't hear the voice. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, now I can hear you. Yep. Okay, perfect. Good to go. Okay. Um, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, so I'll present multiple aspects uh, related to the research on two dimensional coordination polymers in our group. Uh, so the first revolutionary two dimensional material was graphene. Uh, which was obtained by exfoliation of graphite, uh, inspired by the structure and properties of graphene. Further studies focused on uh, developing new uh, metal organic two-dimensional uh, networks. And 
um, uh, these uh, two-dimensional networks in the form of uh, coordination polymers contain both inorganic and organic uh, blocks, which offer wide possibilities for structural diversification and different areas of applicability. Uh, the coordination polymers are distinguished primarily by uh, their chemical tunability, high structural porosity, uh, which give uh, the, uh, multiple uh, nano size effects. They have an array of uh, properties that are of interest for multiple possible applications with large added value. And the properties of these material can be controlled by uh, multiple factors uh, at the choice of the synthetic chemist, uh, such as uh, the uh, ratio between the metal and the ligand, the nature of the metal ions that are used, the uh, number and geometry of coordination, the state of metal oxidation, and the nature of uh, the organic uh, ligand spacers. Uh, the main challenges related to uh, these uh, materials are the large scale production of coordination polymers with good quality, good stability of individual nanosheets. There are two main approaches uh, used for exfoliating the stacked two dimensional polymers top down and bottom up. Uh, I will show here several two dimensional coordination networks recently obtained in which the interpenetration of the layers and the interaction between them are avoided uh, and limited by the use of appropriate ligands. So for preparing two dimensional coordination polymers as uh, easily delaminable nanosheets, we used one free base carboxypropyl tetramethyl disiloxane ligand marked here as H2L1 and several organic nitrogen heterocycles as uh, core ligands. Now the permethylated uh, co uh, coordination polymers were synthesized by uh, using coordination chemistry, mainly a decarboxylic acid with the tetramethyl disiloxane spacer as a uh, uh, anionic crosslinker uh, marked here as H2L1 in combination with nitrogen heterocyclic compound as neutral ligand marked L2 for multiple transition metals from metal salts marked uh, MX. So this way, an entire library of two-dimensional coordination polymers were synthesized uh, as single crystals uh, using the tetramethyl disiloxane uh, space decarboxylic acid and nitrogen heterocycle uh, colligands. Uh, basically, by di diversifying the permethylated component, uh, in, with synthesis of new carboxylic compounds, which contain it, and by locate, locate, uh, its location in the coal ligand. These uh, uh, materials, all these uh, coordination polymers were characterized in terms of their thermal properties, their uh, magnetic behavior, their uh, water vapor sorption and gas sorption properties. The, uh, uh, these coordination polymers can be isolated as single crystals and were analyzed by uh, polarized light microscopy, scanning electron microscopy and transmission electron microscopy, as can be seen in these images. Also by X-ray diffraction, we can see that uh, the orientation of the tetramethyl disiloxane segments on both sides of the two-dimensional array uh, in the left side image and uh, the packaging of the uh, uh, layers on the right side image. The two-dimensional layers interact by van der Waals forces. Uh, we also studied the uh, behavior and presence of water. So these materials have a hydrophobic behavior and also they have a high porosity of the crystal structure. Uh, these uh, co uh, coordination polymers have the capacity to self assemble uh, as aggregates uh, from solvent uh, in different matrices, for example, 
in a matrix of an organic inorganic polymer such as PDMS or in organic materials such as uh, pyrene. Uh, the functional groups that are uh, on the edges of the two-dimensional uh, network uh, show chemical reactivity. Uh, there is a possible arrangement of free functional carboxyl groups at the edge of the two-dimensional layer. And we can see the analysis by fluorescence spectroscopy and infrared spectroscopy uh, demonstrate the complexation of free carboxylate groups of uh, different metal ions, such as uh, ions of uh, europium. And uh, these uh, polymers uh, showed uh, the uh, metathesis reaction. Uh, where they can exchange uh, cations such as exchanging cobalt with uh, copper or uh, uh, cobalt with europium ions with a respective change in uh, color. And similar to the inorganic uh, two-dimensional materials, uh, coordination polymers such as these can be exfoliated uh, into nanosheets by simple ultrasonication in uh, different solvents, uh, usually low to medium polarity uh, solvents such as tetrahydrofuran. Uh, also, an interesting uh, 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 capability of these polymers, they have they present photo switching. So, in the presence of uh, you, uh, flash of UV light, they can self-organize into micron-sized formation as seen here in uh, atomic force microscopy images. In conclusion, the presence of the um, uh, uh, nanosheets on the nanosheet surface of metal groups limits the intermolecular interactions and allow easy delamination of such aggregates. Uh, the synthesis, the uh, coordination polymers that we synthesize uh, have uh, surface activity and can self-assemble uh, in a, a solution. Uh, these coordination polymers uh, have the possibility to interact through their end chain groups and side groups and participate also in cation exchange reactions uh, and metathesis reaction and can respond to multiple stimuli such as uh, ultraviolet light and magnetic fields. Thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? Thanks for this nice talk. Uh, George, I guess we have to move on because we are running out of time. So if the audience have questions, they can ask, ask you on the chat panel. And also I heard that they can ask you directly from the app. Okay. Uh, okay. And you yep. will receive an email. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the nice talk. So the I will next... uh, stop share. Uh, yeah, you can stop sharing. So the next talk will be uh, from Professor Xiaodong Zhuang uh, from Shanghai, uh, Jiao Tong University. So his presentation is uh, uh, the mesoentropy materials, uh, the carbon, mesoentropy carbon. Okay, please go ahead. The paper of the mesoentropy materials from pH isomers to toxic effects of graphene is the uh, same to the topic. Uh, in a brief case, we uh, have it as uh, mesoentropy carbon. Okay, I will briefly introduce myself. Uh, now I work in Shanghai Jiao Tong University and uh, uh, the PI of the 2D lab, and uh, from now on, the mesoentropy matter lab. And uh, where this talk comes from? from this question. Do we have a picture of carbon family? As we know, we we, we, we know we know the carbon nanotube, fluorine, graphene, graphite, uh, diamond, uh, the famous carbon 
uh, species, but uh, from on the developing or discovery of graphene procedure, we understand uh, that graphene is one layer of graphite. Then how how this happened to develop a new material? So we think of this procedure is one kind of HP increase procedure. Then uh, this procedure is all um, high uh, entropy increase procedure. Then the we increase the entropy further. So we start to think about to increase the uh, five seven memory ring to the pure six ring of graphene. And then we simplify this uh, case <coughs> like this one. We have the pure six ring. And then we introduce the four eight memory. And uh, for this case, we have the six six and the five seven memory. So the lower ones, the lower entropy case, the higher case are the high entropy cases. We have these two papers about this topic. And uh, from so far, we have developed many kinds of uh, uh, carbon species. Uh, as you can see from here, the ring diamond graphite graphene covalent tube. And so we, uh, so far we don't have uh, too many inf uh, information to define the relationship of these uh, isomers and this, this carbon species. We open uh, to the simple cases, for example, from here we found the small molecules from uh, from common molecules. So uh, we name it the isomer from the text book. Uh, we can find different kinds of uh, isomers, uh, such uh, names, application, and uh, definitions. So this is classification and the definitions is not really a relationship. So it's uh, not easy to understand. So we from one case, the defects of uh, uh, thing. So we introduced one five seven memory, and one five eight memory, and then two five seven memories. Then we increase the number of the non six memory to increase the, the systems, the entropy. Then entropy answer for these cases. And what is entropy? There is one kind of entropy, vibrational entropy. And we also have rotational entropy and carrier entropy. Also, you mentioned entropy and, uh, and entanglement entropy. But the most famous entropy is the thermodynamic entropy. So we start from this case, from the thermodynamic uh, from the textbook, we can find the number for diamond is 2.3, for graphite is 5.7. And uh, everyone know we, how we fabricate uh, the theory. We have the graphite electric here. Uh, after the arc, uh, we can produce the carbon gas. The entropy for the carbon gas, the carbon gas is more than 150. So it's a high entropy species. After being done, we can get the fluorine carbon in the tube. Uh, what's new for the fluorine? It's 27. So we can see the value for the fluorine locates between the graphite and the carbon gas. So still we can find the couple of any tube in locates between these numbers. From the small dynamic uh, entropy, we can find the relationship of this carbon and species. And from the uh, commercial uh, regulation, we can calculate the small molecular entropy. For example, we have two kinds of uh, isomers here. Uh, pure six, six ring and seven, five memory. And in this case, we can see from here the pure six rings molecules have lower entropy. 
values. For the topology, so we already developed uh, different cases from, uh, here uh, in the community. This kind of five, six, and seven member uh, graphene uh, ribbon have been reported. Also, we find the next five-seven member in the, from different positions. Uh, we can find the band gap can be easily tuned. And uh, this is uh, the conclusion. Uh, the most entropy could be the picture, could offer a key for picture of couple species. For example, we are right to the to a small size of graphene species and to the carbon gas. For pure graphene, we can introduce the long six membrane. We also name it as graphene boundary. Uh, we can use such a graphing boundary to open the band gap of the brain. And all the, the can even increase the number of the five membranes. Okay, so for the hybridization, we also have similar uh, phenomena. For example, here diamond, graphite, uh, poly, ink, and uh, cup gas. And we know the full the hybridization. For the foreign is SP uh, two and two eight, uh, which locates between the SP three and the SP two, and all graph uh, fifteen uh, also have uh, the SP numbers between the graphite and the pure SP. And uh, here is the next uh, uh, the picture I want to. Talk to everybody that we locate in the metal entry world. And for the carbon materials, we have the entropy and the low entropy species. Actually, everything is metal entropy. We can use metal entropy to define the different kinds of carbon materials. Okay. Thank you. Very interesting talk. Any questions? We have time for just maybe one or two brief questions. So I have a quick question. So how you, I noticed that you have some uh, non-contact AFM imaging done on the material. So how will you transfer your sample uh, onto a substrate, onto a surface? Yeah, when you talk about, I think you have a couple of slides with images. Yep, here. Yeah, this one and also that one. Yeah, this is uh, from the calculation from my experiment. I believe you. No, the next one, the slide number seventeen. Yeah, this one. Is this the image? Yes. The, it's yeah. The image. This is yeah. the atomic uh, uh, resolution. So we can. Distinguish different atoms being so we can find the five memory, six memory inside. You can calculate how many rings inside, how many kinds of rings inside. This is not from our group. So this is a text paper which published last year. So called yeah, our okay. attention, which yeah. supports our our group. Yeah, okay, okay, thank you. Uh, so um, our next speaker, oh, by the way, if you have any questions, you can use the app to ask the speaker after his talk. Uh, you can stop sharing right now. Thank you. Uh, our next talk uh, is the speaker here. Uh, the title of the talk is Ultrafast Acoustal Fluidic Exploration and Manipulation of Transition Metal Dichroclide Crystals. From AMGUIDE at Australia. Is the speaker here? So, this is the number fifth talk. Again, I think this is the talk. Also, I don't have any recording to show you guys.
Uh, is the speaker here? Tian, do you have the recording for his presentation or her presentation? No, I don't have it either. Yeah, this is the number of faves. We don't have that. Okay, so sorry about that. We have to pause maybe five minutes. And after that, we move on to the next talk.
So our next talk is the, uh, the title is Observation of Layer Thinning in Exfoliated Tolerant Real Oxygen Annealing. Is the speaker here? Yeah, I saw, I saw that. Okay. Good, that works. Um, hello, uh, can you hear my voice? Yes, uh, I can. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, welcome everyone. This is Ghadira Jalham. Um, should I start right now? Yeah, you can start right now. It's perfect timing. Thank you. Um, welcome everyone. This is Ghadira Jalham, a researcher from King Abdelaziz City for Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia. Today, I'll be happy to present our observation regarding the control thinning of exfoliated tolerine uh, using oxygen annealing, this project was conducted under the supervision of Dr. Mohamed Amr with the help of my colleagues at um, Devices and Sensor Research Lab. Um, when we were looking uh, with um, the 2D black phosphorus and graphene, we faced major problems regarding the preparing of the devices. For example, uh, graphene photodetectors uh, the zero band gap makes it uh, a conductor all the time, damaging the device sensitivity. But on the other hand, black phosphorus small band gap, however, uh, make it, makes it highly reactive uh, at ambient conditions and also limiting its application. Therefore, recently, tolerine attracts more interest because it has uh, excepti exceptionally stable at room temperature and has low toxicity. Also, it has a higher carrier mobility compared to MRS2. Um, although liquid exfoliation is a valuable solution, the small lateral dimension required a new fabrication techniques to study the TE nanosheet properties. In this image, we can see uh, TE flake solutions uh, from a solution sensitive um, uh, was able to get relatively uh, large flakes in a few nanometers. But in our approach, we, have, uh, we are aiming to have a single flake that can be toned at the, its band gap and to compare its physical and electrical properties from bulk to few nanolayers. Um, also, our co um, uh, collaborator achieved tolerine um, photodetectors at room temperature that fully covered the shortwave infrared band with ultra-fast photo response. This free space detector ex um, um, excited from out of plane and collected from the in plane, presenting a big uh, extrinsic responsivity for um, different wavelengths. Uh, this is uh, essentially uh, high um, highlight its uh, photodetector exhibit an exceptionally high anisotropic behav behavior uh, due to TE's unique crystal structure. Therefore, uh, we use the top-down approach in our work by implementing a micro-alignment of the TE flakes uh, on a silicon substrate. And from the AFM image, we tend to get a large uh, thicknesses um, of TE flakes. The Raman in our lab showed uh, the two prominent peaks, A1 mode and A2 mode, where the A1 mode uh, is responsible for, for the chain expansion in the basal plane, and the A2 mode uh, is re responsible from um, the bond bending sim uh, asymmetric stretching. Um, the Raman um, also uh, from the polar figure, we show the Raman angular dependence due to its anisotropic properties. After investigating TE thicknesses using AFN, the Raman spectra, we move, uh, we move forward to control the flake thicknesses by applying annealing to all uh, the TE flakes under oxygen gas at uh, 350 Celsius where a blue shift is observed uh, in all Raman modes after thinning. 
And from the left optical image, we can see the comparison between TE flakes before and after CV deepening. The thickness dro uh, drop for, um, from a few hundred nanometers to a few layers, where the color of the flakes also shifted from bright yellow to gray and um, light blue color. Uh, here we show some of the TE flakes that have the same effect after annealing. All the flakes show a color change, a drop in thickness in the blue shift in Raman spectra, where the first sample has almost two um, by two, uh, a shift by two, both uh, in the A1 mode and the A2 mode. And the second sample show a drastic thinning where it has um, a shift by four. Um, the same also happened in the third graph. This behavior happened for all our samples and the change in the thickness varies depending on the annealing time and uh, temperature. In this slide, I want to mention that TE can be thinned in uh, multiple cycles. Here we were able to thin TE flakes in two cycles where the first treatment was for one hour and the second was um, for less than, for about uh, 10 minutes. Um, from Raman spectra, um, uh, there is a blue shift in uh, the Raman mode after each cycle, indicating that uh, the thickness of TE is decreasing. Um, also, the first cycle uh, shift uh, A1 mode from 121 to 123, and the second cycle tuned, its, uh, tuned it to almost 124. The same happened with the E2 mode, where uh, the TE peaks moved from 121 to 122, then to 124. Uh, during the TE things, the etching is preferred a specific direction um, where um, it's most likely due to its TE uh, anisotropy. And we're positive uh, that um, it's not related to the gas flow direction where we have uh, multiple samples that prove um, this um, indication. Um, also further increase in thinning cycle will uh, reduce the, um, reduce a thinner TE nanosheets. Um, in this uh, slide, we can compare TE thicknesses before and after thinning, where uh, the first sample has a thickness about 600 nanometer. And after thinning, it was shifted to almost 300 nanometer. And the fourth sample, uh, we started by nearly 150 nanometer, and after thinning, it was less than 20 nanometer. And finally, the seven, uh, seven sample uh, started by 270 nanometer and thinned to almost six nanometer in thickness. Each flake, flake can be thinned um, more than that by repeating the annealing cycle. Um, so in conclusion, we can thin TE flakes into few layers. Uh, the thinning is preferring a specific direction and uh, multiple cycle thinning can potentially produce lower thin and thinner TE nanosheets. Our uh, methods can be implementing to create TE devices also. Um, uh, thank you for your listening. And I know this is a quick uh, talk. So. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Thank you for the nice talk. So we have time for a couple of uh, quick questions. Does the audience have any questions? So if you have the questions later on, you can uh, use the app and uh, ask the speaker. Uh, I heard those messages will be sent to her email box sure. directly. Mm -hmm. Sure, thank you. Yep, thank you. So our next talk, uh, it will be uh, a theoretical work. Uh, the title of the talk is a theoretical study of changes in the electronic properties of zeolite under the transition from box 3D to lambda, lam, lambda two dimensional structures. Is the speaker ready?
Joe. Are you here? I do have the recording that I can show. Uh, let me share the screen. Welcome, my name is Juan Antunas Garcia. The title of my presentation is A Theoretical Study of Change in the Electronic Properties of SIP SMI 5 cell light from bull 3D to laminar 2D structure. Cell light are one of the materials with a wide range of applications. For example, they are used to improve the production and quality of first stuff uh, obtained from agriculture and animal health boundary in the production of paints, in the production of medicines uh, and biocompatible processes, um, uh, automotive components, uh, detergents, as catalysts in the petrochemical industry, uh, sensors in the cosmetic industry for the containment of nuclear waste uh, in the fight against pathogens, purification of waste water, and much more. Cellites are microporous crystalline solid with well-defined structure. Most cellites have pore size of one to 10 nanosom. Generally, they, are, they contain silicon, aluminum, and oxygen in the framework and extra framework cation, cations like sodium. The most basic element no matter which your life you refer to, is the tetral structure. It commonly consists of silicon atom surround, surrounded by four oxygen atoms. The oxygen bridge uh, can join these to other tetraedra to give rise to different crystalline structures. It is possible to isomorphically substitute si uh, silicon cations uh, with some trivalent metal. The most common is aluminum, uh, but requires the presence of an exchange cation to balance electrostatic chair deficits. The most common exchange cation, exchange cation is sodium. In the last decade, it has been possible to synthesize different types of laminar zeolites. We have recently published a paper in which, in addition to synthesized SM5 solite in a laminar form, which has been reported in a previous works, to acknowledge, we'll, we report for the first time a laminar solite with a modernized framework. As mentioned above, it is possible to produce laminar solite from different solar framework. However, it's not clear whether the properties change in comparison to both solar. So we will be in the presence of new material that could exhibit exceptional properties. Therefore, the proposal of the present study is theoretically evaluate the dependence of the electronic properties in laminar solar solar under different chemical composition. The present study consisted of three stages. For stage one, we evaluated the good properties of silica light and set SM5 or M5 with one aluminum atom by unit cell. Uh, here, silica light refers to set SM5 cell light framework composed only of silica. In stage two, we evaluate these. Uh, both show light, but in laminar configuration. Since in the model of laminar cell light, there's the surface have oxygen atom with free bonds. In our study, we consider both the case where the free bonds on the surface are saturated with proton or sodium cations. The calculation were carried out using the quantum express code electronic state 
well expanded in terms of plane waves with a finished head kinetic energy cutoff of 45 viper. And considering a charge density cutoff of 360 viper, PVA sold its chain correlation potential was used. All atoms were relaxed until the residual force were below 1 times 2 minus 3 driver angstrom. The convergence tolerance in the calculation was set as 1 to minus 6 driver per, per atom. This is the representation of the unit cell for ZSM5 with two distinct relative orientation. This is on the AB plane. This is on the C8 plane. This is the cell parameter that we're using in our computation. In the unit cell, there are 12 distinct tetragonal sites. Although this tetragonal site can be occupied only by silicon atoms. The reason they are distinct is, is that they complete with different symmetry rules. Also, in a similar way, we have 26 not equivalent sites for silicon atoms. Each of these uh, not equivalent sites follow distinct uh, uh, symmetry rules. But the site is not the same that position. For example, one of these uh, lateral sites have a, a position, a different position. So the total number of two positions are 96. For obsidian atom, the total number of all atoms, or also all positions, are 192. It is the already optimized configuration, the Y representation for both silica light and CXM5 with an aluminum atom. Atom together with the respective exchange cation sodium for this case. The latter configuration comes from having previously determined the minimum energy position, which, according to this figure, is localized in one of the tetral TH sites. According to total density of state for silica lights. We observe a one gap of 5.7 electron volts. When we introduce one on aluminum, this case MFI aluminum, the band gap is reduced to 4.6 electron volts. This is only a representation of the unit cell for laminar set SM5 cell light with two different orientations. In this figure, we have extended the unit cell a little just to show the arrangement of the main channels. These are the optimized laminar configuration for the silica line and set SM5 frameworks. They show the case of protonate uh, and saturated surface with uh, sodium cation, this and this. Uh, the mesh, this mesh shows some structural change uh, that depends on the chemical composition. In contrast to the total density of state uh, previously observed for bull cell light, the band gap of lamellar cell light um, is zero electron volts. This showed that there is a substantial change with decreasing dimensionality. This graph presents the loading chart for distinct oxygen atoms in both silicon electron light and in distinct laminar cell lights. High loading chart values are associated with intrinsic plasticity, while lower values to intrinsic acidity. By comparing both graphs, it's observed that laminar cell light present higher variation in acidity plasticity. Conclusions. The results show that, in contrast to its bold counterpart, regardless of the nature of the change cation, the conduction band gap for the laminar cell light under consideration are zero. In the loading charge analysis, laminar cell lights were found to have a broader range of basicity and acidity values. This represents an improvement compared to both lights 
because the atom has a greater predisposition to donate and accept electrons, which is reflected in the considerable reduction of the band gap. Thank you so much for your attention. So I just stopped the sharing um, because the speaker is not here. We, uh, if you have any questions, uh, just uh, use the app and send him the messages directly. Uh, okay. So our next talk is the speaker here. Uh, the talk will be about the theory of electronic and optical properties of pristine <clears throat> and reflective graphene quantum dots. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm here. <laughs> But you can, uh, can you hear me clearly? I can hear you clearly. Yes. Okay. So let me try because I have uploaded also my recording. So in case it doesn't work, then you can switch to the record the recording. I have mm -hmm. uploaded my talk in the recorded form. Okay. So let can me... you share the screen? Yeah, I'll share the screen now. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, can you see the screen? I can see, uh, I can see the screen. Is this okay. the full screen? Uh, huh, this is the full screen. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I'm using mm -hmm. LaTeX Beamer format. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so if everything is all right, then I can start. Uh, yeah, you can start. No? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. thank you. So mm -hmm. uh, title of my talk is Theory of Electronic and Optical Properties of Pristine and Defective Graphene Quantum Dots. And I'm Alok Shukla from IIT Bombay Physics Department. And uh, I'm very glad to participate in this and I thank the organizers for inviting me. Okay, so let's go to uh, the background. Pure graphene, as we all know, is a gapless uh, two-dimensional semiconductor, but most optoelectronic applications require a gap. So over the years, lots of research has been done to create the so-called gap graphene and uh, approaches used for the purpose have been chemical modification, adsorption of foreign atoms, quantum confinement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, of quantum confinement, I mean, we can go from a 2D system to 1D system, which uh, are called nano ribbons, and then 0D systems, which are called quantum dots, which are finite fragments. So, in our group over the years, we have performed lots of calculations on nano ribbons and quantum dots. And here I uh, make a presentation about a few of those recent calculations. Okay, so what are uh, graphene quantum dots? Basically, they are any finite fragment of graphene. You can just take the infinite sheet of graphene and cut it in any way you like, and you will end up with a graphene quantum dot. But here I am presenting a few highly symmetrical graphene quantum dots. The upper one are triangular, the one on the right uh, left uh, lower panel is hexagonal and then we have a diamond shaped quantum dot. So they differ uh, from each other in terms of the uh, point group symmetry which they have. However, uh, there is uh, no requirement I mean, uh, that you, you ought to have only regular and symmetric shaped quantum dots. You can have very irregular, actually more often than not, you will have irregular and asymmetric quantum dots and the edges uh, of quantum dots can be zigzag, armchair, mixed or any, anything one can imagine because disorder will be there. So one can probe the influence of symmetry because uh, you can have different symmetries. So one can probe the influence of symmetry on the optical properties. That's an interesting thing in itself. And in reduced dimensions, we know that the electron correlation effects are enhanced because electrons are packed close to each other. So in my opinion, graphene quantum dots are ideal playgrounds for studying several effects. Uh, together, namely disorder, correlation, quantum confinement, etc. <clears throat> okay, a uh, few general comments about the graphene quantum dots. So, pure carbon uh, based graphene quantum dots will have dangling bonds at the edges, which will lead to edge reconstruction. However, uh, quantum dots with passivated edges by hydrogen or some other functional group normally retain a planar symmetric structure. So hydrogen saturated structures are called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in organic chemistry, and they are essentially pi conjugated molecules. So 
we all know that the low lying excitations in such systems are mainly due to pi electrons okay so in our work we assume that the graphene quantum dots which we consider are have passivated edges so uh, graphene quantum dots for us are like uh, phs okay and wherever available we will compare our theoretical results with the results on the corresponding ph ph and because we are using an effective pi electron approximation for graphene quantum dots i mean being uh, they being pi electron systems so uh, there has been a model in chemistry since 1950 three uh, proposed by popel pariser and pa uh, par which is called pariser par popel or in short ppp model which is basically a semi empirical hamiltonian uh, meant for pi electron systems it assumes sigma pi separation and uh, it assumes that only pi electrons are important so that model hamiltonian uh, reads like this this is uh, given in second quantization notation you need not uh, know all the creation and annihilation operators so the three terms here are on uh, on the right hand side of the equation are the hopping it i and j denote the carbon sites so here saturation saturating atoms play no role only the carbon uh, one uh, pi electron per carbon atom is assumed and only carbon atoms play the important role because it's a effective hamiltonian so we have uh, hopping matrix elements then you have hubbard u namely the repulsion felt by two electrons if they are on the same carbon atom and then electron repulsion felt by two electrons which are on different carbon atoms so uh, hopping hubbard u and long range coulomb interactions okay but uh, this is not an ab initio approach so uh, being a semi empirical approach we have to come up with the values reasonable values for uh, these parameters namely hopping u and v okay so normally in uh, carbon based systems i mean hydrocarbon molecules uh, hopping is restricted to nearest neighbor and its value is taken to be 2.4 ev okay and uh, the parameterization for the long range coulomb interaction is done in terms of uh, two three parameters actually or uh, one could say two one is hubbard u which we have to choose then uh, the second one is uh, kappa which is like the dielectric constant of the medium and then we have rij is the distance between the two carbon atoms in angstrom units okay <clears throat> so we have uh, a standard set of parameters which were initially proposed by ono and there one takes u is equal to 11.13 ev and kappa is equal to 1 however chandros and my collaborator mazumdar in 1997 proposed a set of different parameters okay and uh, they are called screen parameters and they were very well uh, for any system with phenylene rings and because uh, graphene will have all these hexagons so i expect them to uh, perform well for graphene quantum dots so here u is taken to be atv and kappa dielectric constant is taken to be 2 okay so let me briefly give our computational approach because uh, this is different from uh, most of the dft calculations and other first principles calculations so we initiate the calculations at the hartley-fock level uh, using the ppp hamiltonian and uh, for the purpose we use our own program which we published in 2010 and it's publicly available if anyone is interested okay and then after obtaining the molecular orbitals so we include we transform the hamiltonian from uh, site representation to molecular orbital representation and include the electron correlation effects by means of the configuration interaction approach and depending on the size of the system one can use full ci or uh, one of the restricted ci approaches such as quadruple ci or multi reference singles and double ci okay and uh, here i am listing five of our uh, rather recent papers published using this approach on a variety of systems and studying a variety of phenomena okay and in this talk i am i am going to talk about paper number 4 and 5 okay and uh, uh, so this is what i discuss next i'll start with the discussion of paper 4 which is about lower symmetry polycyclic hydrocarbons so in a study earlier actually in 2014 we had it was a experiment theory study of coronene 
which is a very high symmetry molecule, same symmetry as uh, benzene, D6H symmetry molecule, and we studied its optical properties. So in this more recent work, we thought that let us study coronine derivatives because they have lower symmetry as compared to the parent molecule. Okay, and uh, let us study the optical, how the optical properties change as compared to coronine. Okay, so the net of our results, uh, the comparison is shown here. And one can see that the optical absorption spectrum changes significantly uh, when the symmetry is lowered from D6H to C2V to Cs, and as the molecule becomes less and less symmetric. Okay, so but we'll go deeper into the subject. So in this uh, particular paper published last year in JPCC, Journal of Physical Chemistry C, okay, we in reality studied four molecules. Uh, the first one. And the last one I showed in the previous page. Okay, so you add one more phenyl ring to the coronine and you get benzocoronine. Okay, two more you get naphtho, three more you get anthra, and then you can add. Unfortunately, you, you cannot add. I mean, there is no known compound where there are four extra rings that is uh, tetra coronine or something like that. But however, uh, there is you can add one more ring here, and then you get a highly asymmetric compound called naphtho 812 abc coronine. Okay, so in our calculations, we assumed uniform bond lengths, which is just fine for, uh, uh, I mean, uh, for semi empirical calculations, and also uniform bond angles of 120 degrees. And we performed a large scale multi-reference singles and double CI calculation with CI matrix sizes ranging from 600,000 to 6 million. So this is fairly large scale calculation. So we expect our results to be fairly accurate and with the electron correlation effects well accounted for. Okay, so uh, let us compare. I mean, uh, it's, it was a much bigger paper and I have uh, uh, only 15 minutes here. So let me just uh, briefly summarize uh, the results which we obtained at various levels of theory on the homolumo gap, okay, on the optical gap, okay. You can see that uh, using the tight binding model, we get very low values, okay, for the gap, and uh, the, they are likely to be wrong because uh, we, for a couple of molecules, we have experimental results here, so they are much, uh, much less than the experiments, so they are likely to be wrong for the other two also. Uh, however, if you look at, and then we performed uh, PPP model calculations at uh, hartley fock level and at MRSDCI level, that is including the electron correlation effects. So you can see that the best agreement is obtained when you compare them with the experiments is with MRSDCI calculations, electron correlated calculations performed using the screen parameters as we expected. But let us go, uh, uh, somewhat deeper into the individual molecules. Okay, so here is the entire calculated optical absorption spectrum of uh, benzo A coronine. Okay, and here uh, on top we have uh, results using standard parameters. On bottom with the screen parameters. Okay, and here the the essence is because uh, our results agreed more on optical gap uh, with respect to the screen parameters. So we expect those results to be true, okay? The first peak in all the calculations is dominated by, is Y polarized, Y direction being this direction, vertical direction, okay? And is dominated by the single excitation, homo to lumo transition, while the most intense peak uh, for our case, uh, I mean, for screen parameter case, most intense peak will be this one, okay? Uh, most intense peak uh, for uh, uh, is the second peak, sorry. Okay, so is due to two equally contributing excitations H to L plus one and H minus one to L. Okay, uh, six peak for screen parameters is also quite intense, but it's not the most intense. Uh, second peak in all both, are, both sets of calculations is the most intense. Okay. And then uh, we uh, we have also given here the optical absorption spectrum for the asymmetric, highly asymmetric molecule. Okay, and here uh, again the results with two sets of parameters. Uh, again, with screen parameters, as we saw earlier, we are getting very good uh, agreement with the experiments. And the first peak is again dominated. First peak being this one, which has a mixed polarization, is again dominated by a homo to lumo transition, and the most intense peak. For this case, which is the second peak, 
is also dominated by a similar transition as uh, in the previous molecule, HOMO to LUMO plus one and HOMO minus one to LUMO. Okay, uh, but we can do a better comparison for these two molecules for which experimental data is available. So we are comparing our theoretical results with the experimental data of Bagley et al. Okay, and these are the symmetries of our calculated peaks. These are the peaks which the experimentalists observed and these are the locations of the peaks according to our theory, string parameter calculations. And you can see that generally the agreement is very good. So we were very happy with this. Okay, so this finishes my discussion of lower symmetry polyaromatic hydrocarbons. Okay, let me go to the next topic, uh, which is uh, what happens to the optical absorption spectra of graphene quantum dots when topological defects such as stone veils defects are introduced. And we, uh, while studying this, we thought uh, we came up with some novel applications of this, proposed applications, which we are, uh, I, I'll also briefly discuss. Okay, so this is, uh, this work is entirely based upon this paper, which I, uh, the work which I did with the Tista and Tushima, Tushima, two sisters, who are my collaborators. Okay, and uh, it was published only a few months back. So motivations for this study are as follows. Uh, everyone knows that pristine uh, graphene quantum dots cannot be used to design efficient uh, visible light harvesting devices. The reason being that uh, optical absorption for these dots is very poor in the visible range. But uh, one can enhance uh, light absorption in the visible range or can one enhance the light absorption uh, in the visible range by introducing topological defects? This was the question, okay? And what is the influence of these defects on the optical properties? Okay, so let us go right into it. So we considered three uh, different type of quantum dots. On the right hand, uh, on the left hand side, we have a rectangular quantum dot with 64 carbon atoms called GQD 64, which is pristine without any defects. In the middle, we have a, the same quantum dots, but with uh, stone veils defects at the end. So here you can see heptagon, pentagon shapes at, at one of the edges. Okay, and then the third one, so this we call SW1, the one with the stone wheels defect at the edge. And the third one is again uh, 64 atom quantum dots with stone wheels defects. You can see pentagon, heptagon, pentagon here. Okay, stone wheels defect right in the middle of the quantum dot. So first we did the geometry optimization of uh, these three quantum dots, okay, to obtain the correct bond lengths and all that uh, to be used in our calculations. So quite expectedly, we found that the lowest energy quantum dot was uh, the pristine quantum dot. Then SW1, that is uh, with the, the stone wheels defect at the edge is uh, 2.77 EV higher than the pristine one. And SW2, that is uh, stone wheels defect in the middle is 4.14 EV higher, okay? So the quantum, so, Anyway, I have uh, already uh, mentioned what is written in the points here. So let me move on to the next slide. Okay. Let us uh, look at the optical gaps for the three structures. Okay. So again, we uh, studied it at three levels of theory, type binding, PPP model Hartree-Fock, okay, and PPP model MRSDCI, which we call PPPCI in short. And here we used only the screen parameters, no standard parameters, okay? So we see that uh, for type binding, we are getting a very low gap. For We are getting a somewhat higher gap with the Hartree fog and a much higher gap with the CI calculations, okay? And, uh, but the most dramatic change, so we do note that the optical gaps of the three quantum dots are different from each other's at all levels of theory, okay? So although the difference in uh, type binding level between uh, pristine and SW2 structure is not much, but there are significant differences at other levels of theory, okay? Uh, so significant meaning at least 0.1 EV uh, at the CI level, but the most dramatic changes occur when you look at the optical absorption spectrum, okay? So on the left panel, we have the optical absorption spectrum of the pristine dot on, in the middle, we have optical absorption spectrum of the dot with the stone wheels at the edge. And here we, on the right panel, we have optical absorption spectrum of the dot 
with the respect uh, uh, which has uh, stone wells in the middle okay so uh, first a few features for a pristine dot homo to lumo transition defines optical gap but uh, a dramatic change occurs for the defective quantum dots that homo to lumo state is no longer the lowest state rather h to l plus 1 and h minus 1 to l uh, they become the lowest state so structure introduces subtle changes in the system okay and in okay, the are you Hello? going to wrap up soon? Yeah, yeah, yeah I have yeah. to interrupt just, because my yeah, yeah. Uh, just two more slides. That's it. This is my last. Uh, uh, well, just, one more yeah, slide because we are over okay. five minutes. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So for uh, the defective uh, quantum dots, Homo uh, Lumo configuration contributes dominantly to the second peak, and we have a major oscillator strength redistribution, as you can see. That now many peaks appear in the low energy region for the defective quantum dots okay and so i can summarize here the findings for this particular work that uh, for pristine quantum dots we found that 59 percent of the total uh, optical absorption is in the visible domain but uh, for s stone whales defect sw1 quantum dot 65 percent of the absorption is in the visible domain but the most dramatic change occurs for the quantum dot with the stone wheels in the middle 83 percent of the absorption spectrum is in the visible domain so uh, clearly we see that if one could uh, create these stone wheels defect in a controlled manner then one can uh, use these for absorption in the uh, i mean uh, in the devices where the absorption is needed in the visible region of light Okay, and after this uh, summary and outlook, we can briefly ignore because I have already sent. And these are my collaborators. Sumit Mazumdar is in the US itself. These are for uh, present collaborators, Tisa, Tushima, and Pritam. And my research has been supported by Department of Science and Technology India and also by Indo US Science and Technology Forum. Thank you so much for your attention. And I'm very sorry that I exceeded the time limit. Okay. Yep. Thank you for the, uh, the the nice talk and detailed information. So we really don't have time for questions. So if you have any questions from the audience, uh, use the app and send the messages directly to the speaker. So our next talk, uh, the title of the talk is Spectroscopic and the Structural Properties of Atomically Thin by be doped MOS2 Films uh deposited using near ir ferro uh, femtosecond pulse laser uh, cells so the speaker is uh dr cha can you share the screen is the speaker here uh so if not let me see whether i have the the recording I do have the recording. I can share the screen. Good afternoon. This is a presentation on rare FI and doped and undoped 2D. MOS2 thin films for optoelectronic and photonic device applications. My name is Animesh Jha. I am professor at the University of Leeds, and this research presentation is in collaboration with the Indian Institute of Science, Education, and Research in Bhopal, India. Uh, the research work has been supported by the UKRI and the University Grant Commission in India. My co-authors co are Ashwin, Isik Rao, Adarsh, and Nadi, and Andrew Scott. Um, these colleagues have contributed to, um, to the different parts of my uh, of, of this presentation. So the outline of my presentation includes publication of undoped and doped OS2 thin films using from second pulse laser deposition technique. How we synthesize these target materials that will be included in the discussion, and how we characterize the deposited materials using Raman spectroscopy TEM with EDX 
extra photoelectron spectroscopy, UV visible characterization technique, and some limited data on nonlinear properties of um, 2D thin films using Z scan and exciton characterization. And I will conclude. So the main objective of present research is to deposit thin films of MRS2 containing rare rags on a centimeter scale so that devices can be fabricated for photonic and optoelectronic applications. If we want to do that, then we must establish the methodology of characterization of these materials, which would include <clears throat> determination of the electronic and molecular states of the material, uh, structures of the material using Ramon and uh, microstructure analysis techniques, ultra-fast nonlinear optical characterization of rare doped and undoped films are very also are, are also important for photonic device applications. Um, we will also demonstrate how we have characterized the photoluminescence properties of vitrobium doped MOS2, which we have made, because it's an interesting material for photonic applications. Ultimately, we want to develop the silica on silicon vapor technology for uh, dichalcosinide thin films. So very quickly, we look at the deposition chamber, we have titanium sapphire laser, in which we have also a deposition chamber. Um, the parameters of first laser is 100 per second, 1 kilohertz. Deposition temperature is 500 degrees centigrade. Laser fluence is 3 joule per centimeter square. And we regulate the pressure inside the chamber. The material uh, target materials we use is undoped MOS2 and ethorbium doped MOS2, which we synthesized by heat treatment techniques. Uh, um, this target material was placed inside the chamber and silica was our substrate material. Um, during the deposition, the distance between target and uh, substrate was capped between 50 to 70 nanometers to achieve required thin film uh, of right kind of thickness. Once the deposition completed, we take the materials out for character. So this picture here, again, going into detail, we have, um, by using peak fitting analysis, we have characterized different vibrational modes. These are all consistent with the literature using um, this anal analytical technique, we have characterized the thickness of the each layer, and we find that we have between three to five layers, which we verified using transmission electron microscopy technique. Please note that at the substrate, at, uh, at the interface between silica substrate and the very first layer of molybdenum disulfide, the film is not continuous. This is discontinuous. As the more layers grow, they become continuous. This very interesting question, which as a material scientist, I find very fascinating. And it tells us how nucleation and growth might be taking place in, the, in such 2D. So <clears throat> now going back to using the Raman spectroscopic technique for um, characterizing the crystallinity of the film and the uniformity of the film. Here are the three slides. You can see here the um, uh, Raman spectroscopic technique is used for um, uh, just characterizing one layer, uh, uh, very thin film. And then as we change the thickness uh, sorry, maintain the thickness and make larger area film. We have characterized at different spots under the same condition. And we find the film appears to be relatively uniform. And this was done on a two and two by two centimeter surface of silica glass. 
as we change the thickness, the peak shifts to higher energy. As we have lower thickness, there is a different shape, slightly different shape you can see here. And this, by peak fitting analysis, you can characterize these peaks, how the shifts are taking place. Um, uh, and, these are, uh, and these are very important, particularly when you are looking at very thin film. Detailed XPS analysis is given here. You can see um, uh, we have the doped and undoped molybdenum disulfide. And in the table below, we have the binding energies for the 2H molybdenum disulfide and one T form of molybdenum disulfide. This is the indirect semiconductor. And this is the direct band gap semiconductor. What we find that in the <clears throat> indirect band gap semiconductor, the binding energies on uh, overall is fractionally smaller than that is in the direct band gap semiconductor. And that's not unexpected. Uh, final couple of slides. This is the room temperature PL uh, analysis. As you know, we have doped this film with ytterbium sulfide. Ytterbium has only two levels. The ground, the upper state is separated from the ground state with an energy gap of around one electron volt. And using this uh, because this is around one electron volt, that means we can use 980 nanometer laser to excite the terbium ions. And that's the 980 nanometer peak, you can see in the PL. And you can see the P emission peak from ytterbium. When you look at it in detail, you don't see any peak in the ytterbium uh, in the undoped film, whereas in the doped film, we see ytterbium emission. This emission is much, much narrower than what we see in, in, in glass and bulk materials. So this room temperature PL data is quite important. Further work is required to characterize the lifetime of the thin, uh, uh, lifetime of ytterbium ions and thin. Final point, we have compared the saturable absorber intensities using this scan technique, and we have studied the saturable absorption intensities in three different types of materials shown here, undoped, 0.5% doped, and 1.25% doped. And we find as we increase the terbium ion concentration, the saturable absorption intensities are dropping quite dramatically. This is expected to some, to some point because you are creating more um, excited states. And this may be the reason why such materials could be useful for such a So in concluding slide, we have demonstrated ytterbium disulfide, ytterbium sulfide doping in molybdenum disulfide. We have characterized these films we have characterized PL in these films, um, and we have characterized saturable absorber, proper, uh, saturable absorption properties at room temperature. In future, we want to undertake more detailed time-resolved spectroscopy, um, uh, um, ultra-fast transient absorption spectroscopy, and more detailed DFT and cast calculations for thicker films, and final point that how to make these devices over large areas. Thank you. So I have stopped the sharing uh, for this talk. Thank for the speaker. Uh, so the, the next one, uh, the next talk, uh, it will be, uh, the title of the talk is, uh, let me see. A uh, functionalization of exposed core fibers with CBD grown monolayer transition metal dichromate. And the speaker is Falk uh, from Germany. Are you here?
Is the speaker here? So let me see whether I have the, the recording. Okay, I do. Thank you uh, for a kind introduction. Uh, my name is Fak Eiler, and I will be uh, telling you about yet another novel material system, uh, namely transition, monolayer transition metal dietary cordylines, and on how to integrate them with optical fibers and some interesting experiments in optics photonics we've done in these. And we've recently done this hybrid and nonlinear system. So, um, so the material in question uh, for today is this uh, transition metal tetracodronides. It's somewhat similar to uh, graphene in, in the sense that it forms monolayer crystals, with the difference that this monolayer crystal is not a single layer of uh, atoms, but it consists of unit cells of three atoms, namely a gel collagen layer on the top, a, a transition metal layer in the center, and a gel collagen layer at the bottom. And these materials are very, very interesting for optics and photonics because they are semiconductors and with a particular quirk that if you transition from the box or from the multi-layer system to the monolayer system, they transition from an indirect to a direct band gap, as you can see on the left-hand side of the screen from the, uh, from the uh, energy band structure, you see this on the top here for the bulk which is an indirect transition at the bottom, you have a direct transition at the K point. And of course, this change from indirect to a direct transition um, enhances a lot of light matter interaction effects rather drastically, as you can see here, for example, from a photoluminescence spectrum, right? So you excite your material with short wavelength light, and then if you have a monolayer crystal, and uh, you observe this nice and very, very strong photoluminescence in the uh, in the red is at 670 nanometers, as opposed to if you have a two layer crystal, then this photoluminescence is uh, very, very negligible. And this photoluminescence is driven by electron hole pairs, uh, which are frequently called excitons. And um, now this is not all of the effects which these materials have, which are interesting for optics and photonics, and I'm not going to go through all the other effects which are of interest as well. I'd just like to convince you that each of these effects will lend themselves uh, very nicely for applications in optics and photonics. However, um, you can't just use the materials by themselves. You first of all have to fabricate these materials and you have to integrate them with optical systems. Yeah? And you have to do so in a scalable manner because the state of the art at the moment is to transfer from bulk material. And of course, this is something which does not lend itself for, for many applications. So the um, approach we pursue is we use a mechanical vapor deposition where you basically take vapors of the chaconchonite, in this case of sulfur, and of your transition metals, and then you bring them in contact with your growth substrate uh, in the reactor under specific uh, circumstances. And if you do everything right, you will observe growth of monolayer crystals on your substrates. Yeah? As an example here on the bottom left, these are monolayer crystals of molybdenum sulfide. And you can also change the composition of your precursors during the growth. And then you can, for example, also create um, heterostructures. In this case, we have heterostructure of molybdenum selenide in the center and on the outside it's tungsten selenide and the transition edge between the two if the pn junction, if you so wish, um, is um, of a potential quality. These materials are all fundamental materials, which means out of plane, they only bind very, very weakly. Yeah? And this has a profound impact on growth, namely that they will grow in almost all uh, materials, irrespective of their epitaxial compatibility. And so in this case, the growth is on silicon dioxide, which is of course not crystalline at all, but you still observe this crystalline growth most. What's maybe even more profound is 
that you can grow them also on non-planar structures. So they just they grow both non epitaxially and also conformally. And therefore, this approach lends itself very nicely to direct integration of photonic circuits. And the simplest photonic circuit you can think about, I guess, is an optical fiber. So this is exactly what we did. We took a special kind of optical fiber, which you can see on the left hand side here, um, in the cross section. So you have the fiber extending out of the screen. In the gray area, silicon dioxide, so it's glass, yeah, and all the dark areas air. Now the photonically interesting thing uh, part happens in the center of this fiber here, yeah, where you have a guiding core which is made of silicon dioxide, the optical mode that propagates in this core, and it's surrounded by air. The important part here is that the top surface uh, is exposed to the outside world. And if you place it in your CVD reactor, you will um, observe growth of transition metal dichocogenite crystals on the surface. And this can interact with your guided mode by means of the evanescent field of this guided mode, which kind of sticks it out into the and into the air region and therefore interacts with your transition metal And we have tested this approach works for quite a lot of transition metal dichocogenides. In one image you can see on the right hand side, so you have the optical fiber here. So in an experiment light propagates this way. Yeah. This entire thing has a diameter of roughly 200 micrometers and you see these nice monolayer crystals being grown on the fiber. Now, at first you need to convince yourself that these crystals that you observe really are monolayer crystals. So we measured quite a lot of AFM and uh, uh, AFM and Raman maps. And what you basically see is under the AFM, you get a height of these crystals of about 0.7 nanometer, which is just what you expect for monolayer. And you get a Raman shift of 20.5 centimeter, which is also what you would expect from the monolayer. So we've confirmed that we really have a conform approach of monolayers on these fibers. And as a next step, we'll also look into the electronic properties to better understand that. We measure the photoluminescence and compare it with the photoluminescence from crystals, which are grown on planar substrates. Yeah? So the photoluminescence map, again, this is our optical fiber. Optical fibers are basically placed in this direction. You look at it from the side, you make a photoluminescence map of the core region, and you see this nice monolayer crystals here. Yeah. And if you take a spectrum here or there, then you typically get curves which look like that, which are pretty much identical from the monolayer crystals on the bulk surface. Yeah. Uh, peak at 670 and full with half marks of roughly 40 nanometers. So basically, we just see strong DL and put good quality of the monolayers. Now we're good to go to actually measure to actually do in-fiber experiments. As we take a light source, we focus the light source in the optical core, we propagate light down the, and, uh, down the optical fibers, and then we observe what is coming out of the other side, these are cameras and spectrometers, or we observe the light which is emitted sideways using the camera. So we use sideways emission basically for determining the area coverage of our MOS2 on the optical. Fibers can basically just count the number of photoluminescence peaks. And for this specific fiber, I'm going to show you the results here today. We basically found that we have roughly 5% area coverage and the total amount of crystals on an 18 millimeter long fiber, 18 millimeter long fiber of roughly one millimeter. And now keep in mind, usually you have to do transmission experiments with transition metal dichocogenides, so you have an interaction length of, um, of one nanometer, and now we have an interaction length of one millimeter, which is like a six orders of magnitude increase. Okay, so as the first thing, we uh, were looking into uh, into photoluminescence. So we look at the exit port of the fire, we send it through a few long pass filters, and you get this nice spot of light which is emerging from the core of the optical fiber. You can then measure spectrum from this, and depending on which material of the fiber, you really see these nice photoluminescence peaks, which just look like the photoluminescence peaks 
from your pristine material, which is chromium planar substrate. Yeah, so we've basically now excited excitons through the fiber, and we've also collected the emission light again in the fiber mode, which means that we can actually do in fiber experiments with this kind of system. The second effect that we um, looked into is second harmonic generation. And you're probably aware that optical fibers do not show second harmonics simply because they're made of glass, which is an amorphous substance, and therefore it does not have a kind of non-linearity. Any kind of second harmonic that you actually see in optical fibers, which is usually almost negligible, comes from um, optical surfaces or from some contaminations. So, and what we've done is we've basically taken our fibers, yeah, and uh, we have measured second harmonic in here. So what you see are the solid lines. Sorry. What you see are the solid lines at the bottom, which is the 50 times increased second harmonic spectrum from the bare optical fibers. And then you have the second harmonic from, uh, uh, from our optical fiber, which is much, much stronger than this. So overall, we observe a much a more than three orders of magnitude enhanced second harmonic generation, as opposed to the bare optical fiber from our coated optical fibers. We also see nice kind of power dependence with a slope of two. Yeah. Funnily enough, we see more second harmonic light coming from a shorter piece of fiber as opposed to a longer piece of fiber, which points to the fact that due to the very, very dense coverage um, of, of the fiber with these crystals, we are actually somewhat limited by the optical loss in the second harmonic. Moreover, our system is not phase matched yet at the moment. So we believe that if we go to a regime where we have phase matching, currently investigating various methods to do so, that we may see another three or maybe four or five orders of magnitude enhancement in the second harmonic yet. So as a summary, I've tried to convince you that um, using monolayer growth direct in optical fibers, we can produce a hybrid system where we can access the properties of transition metal to collagenides directly in a guided wave environment. And if we can really interrogate the monolayer properties through an optical fiber, yeah, which therefore kind of is a new uh, platform for experiments in optics photonics with these 2D materials. And demonstrated for you today a like strong second harmonic generation also in fiber photoluminescence. What we've also done is we've looked into enhanced third harmonic generation but due to the time limitation of the talk. I have not spoken about this today. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. So nice talk again. Uh, so we are actually behind the schedule. So the, the next uh, talk is chemistry of 2D uh, mono elements beyond graphene. Is the speaker here? Hello? Okay. So I should have the, the video, let me see. Oh, I don't, I don't have, I don't have the recording for this. Tian, do you have, do you have it? No, no, I don't have it. Either. Okay. But since we are almost like 10 minutes behind the schedule, I think we can start the final talk. Uh, Professor Michael Green. If you are here, you can share the screen. I'm here. Give me just okay, a second. Okay, a big relief. <laughs> Thank you. I think I did upload a recording as well. Yeah, um, yeah. I have your recording. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But since you are here, right? So the talk, the title of the talk is "Oxidation and the Stabilization of 2D Maxine Nano Sheets." Okay. Let me share my screen. Mm -hmm. Hopefully y'all can see it. I can see it. All right, great. <clears throat> I think I'm probably better live than recorded anyway. Um, <laughs> I'm Professor Micah Green. I'm a professor at Texas A&M University in both chemical engineering and material science. 
And I'm excited to talk about Maxine's today because I suspect that some of y'all haven't worked with Maxine's before. Um, and I'll, I'll be able to talk about both synthesis and some of the, the real challenges facing that community. Uh, what you're seeing is a, a, the result of a long-standing collaboration between my group, Miladin Radovich's group, and Jody Lukanes's group, all here at Texas A&M. Uh, we've been working together to make Texas A&M one of the real world leaders in, in Maxine research. Uh, this is a recent picture from my group. You can tell because some of the group members are standing <laughs> far away from each other during COVID, uh, but, but they've been really productive even during the last year and a half. Uh, most of what you're about to see is uh, the, the result of of the work of this student, Zhao Fei Zhao, who recently graduated and uh, um, has, has really done great things in his time here at AM. So if you've never heard of Maxine's, you can think of them kind of like the ceramic equivalent of graphene. The idea is that the, the M is, is usually a metal, titanium is the most common one, but there's, there's lots of them, you know, uh, niobium, vanadium, chromium, things like that. And then the X is either carbon or nitrogen. Usually it's carbon, but people have done a lot with nitrides as well. And then you'll also see people use this T designation. The T just means that these are, these are planar 2D structures, M, X, M, you know, et cetera, or M, X, M, X, like so. And then there are terminal groups. That's what the T is. There are terminal groups, which are, you know, functional groups that allow these things to be water dispersible. So that's why people are so interested in these. They're two-dimensional ceramic nanosheets, and they're typically water dispersible, and they have lots of exciting properties. Um, they're, you know, people have simulated hundreds of these things, and at this point, probably about 30 have actually been made in practice. By far the most common one is TI3C2, titanium carbide. Uh, the way you make them is a little bit of a pain. <laughs> you start with what we call the max phase. So you can see that here, M, titanium, A is aluminum usually, and then the C is X. So this is a layered ceramic phase. And what you do is you use acids like HF to etch out the aluminum. And once you do that, you get structures that look like this. You can imagine like a book with every third page removed um, would look like this, you know, a, a series of 2D sheets that are kind of connected together. And then you can intercalate with solvents and then delaminate or exfoliate into nanosheets and make these really nice uh, nanosheet dispersions like what you see right here. Um, and so there's lots of research on this. Um, they're, they're, uh, um, you know, the, the reason people are excited about them is they're mechanically strong. They can be used for barrier properties, for energy storage. They're electrically conductive. Um, so they're an exciting new material and there's a lot you can do. Um, one of the things that has kept people from doing more work in this area is the fact that, that using hydrofluoric acid is, is very dangerous and a lot of people are not comfortable doing it. So that's, that's definitely slowed things up. So I mentioned that these things are electrically conductive. That's exciting. They have hydrophilic surface groups, which means you can disperse them in water and process them as films. Now we've done a lot of layer by layer work here at Texas A&M. And you can even tune what those surface functionalities are in order to get them to, to interact with an outside surface. Um, okay, uh, and if you just do a, a quick search on, on applications of these materials, there's a lot in the battery realm you know, in terms of energy storage, supercapacitors, a lot with nanocomposites, EMI shielding, and then more recently, even catalysis and sensors. Um, so you may, some of you may be saying, well, if Maxines are such the, you know, the hot new nanomaterial, why, why, do I, why don't I see them all over the place? One of the reasons is what I mentioned, difficulties in synthesis, and the other is that they can often degrade over time. Professor Bar Barsoom from Drexel, he always says, Maxines are like fish. They start to stink after three days. What that means is a lot of these Maxines, like TI3C2, will actually oxidize in water. They turn into TiO2. You'll see them change color. You'll see them come out of solution. And that means you lose their properties. You, you lose that 2D structure. And so for those of you who work on graphene, imagine your graphene went bad three days after you made it. Those are the kind of problems that, that the people in the Maxine community are facing. Um, our group has done a lot in this regard. Um, there's actually a little bit of controversy on what causes oxidation. Um, some early papers had claimed that it was dissolved oxygen in the water. And, and, and frankly, I don't believe that there's not enough oxygen in the water to do that. Um, it's more likely that it is indeed that the actual water that, that interacts. And so um, uh, that's, been, that's been shown even here more recently. So there's been a lot of work to try to mitigate oxidation. Some people have tried to you know, use argon instead of humid air, um, uh, uh, you know, use other solvents other than, than water like isopropanol. Um, my group has, has done quite a bit in this area. I mean, you can freeze them, you can uh, uh, you know, use them at low temperatures, but what we, what we really worked on a lot is using antioxidants. I know that sounds obvious, but uh, no one had really done it. No one had used antioxidants with Maxine's disper Maxine dispersions. So this is Jaffe's work. You can see here's the original dispersion, and after three weeks, it's completely gone. 
But if you use something like sodium ascorbate, then after six months, you still have your dispersion. Uh, we've measured this in a number of different ways using XRD, as you see here. Um, you see a big difference between when you have severe oxidation versus just a little oxidation when you have something like sodium ascorbate here. And we even do, did simulations to show how these materials can fall apart in some cases versus staying together when you use something to protect them. You can also measure this using DLS. Uh, this is the hydrodynamic diameter. It's pretty stable. If you use an antioxidant in water, the, you start to get big aggregates, which you can actually see here in the SEM. Same thing, the zeta potential of these materials in water is fairly stable if you use an antioxidant, whereas things can start to change even on a short time scale if you don't, and eventually these things will crash out and you don't see any kind of 2D structure anymore. So this shows how powerful this technique can be. Um, there's a lot of data here, but this graph on the top right is the one you really need to look at. So here, this shows the atomic composition of the original. And then if you leave it in water, almost all of this Ti3C2 turns into TiO2. Whereas if you use sodium ascorbate, the, the, the changes are much more minimal and, and uh, you get something after months and months that's, that's much more stable. Um, you're able to retain your electrical conductivity. If you use water, um, after, if you have a dispersion of, of maxines in water after three weeks, if you try to make a film, it, it, you won't even be able to measure the conductivity, whereas it stays fairly stable if you use an antioxidant like this. Um, this is the first paper we published on this topic. It was in Matter in 2019. We published a couple since then. This one was the one that really made a lot of um, headlines because one of the antioxidants you can use is ascorbic acid, which some of you may know as vitamin C. And so like we made, this is the front page of the American Ceramic Society. We actually made the front page of uh, the National Science Foundation. Um, and so there was a lot of buzz around that particular work. Since then, we've also looked at the effect of pH. Uh, uh, basically what we're seeing is that if you use an alkaline environment, these things oxidize a lot faster and as the maxine oxidizes, you can actually change the pH environment in the dispersion itself. <clears throat> and so that's how, so, so noting what the pH is of your dispersion can affect how rapidly that happens. Uh, we've also found out that citric acid, another common kitchen item, is a great antioxidant for protecting uh, maxines against, against these kinds of uh, uh, degradation processes. Um, we've even found that this applies not just to Ti3C2, but even Ti2C. So just to so note the stoichiometry here, two one ones, this is a two one, those maxines tend to oxidize even faster. And so there's very little research done on these because they don't have much of a shelf life, but using these kind of oxidant, antioxidants can really protect them and allow people to actually use these in functional devices and functional composites. So um, I know that was fast. Um, I suspect many of you watching haven't thought about maxines before, uh, but we're excited about this material. There's a lot of research going on. Um, I come from more of a graphene background and, and, and you know, dispersion stability. And so the fact that we're able to solve this really key problem facing the community, I think, is one of the most exciting things happening in the maxine research field right now. With that, I'll stop and take questions. Thank you for the nice talk. Do we have any questions from the audience? I have a quick question. So in the beginning, you show how you make the material. So you add yeah. away aluminum and you do the intercalation, right? So yeah, how so you do you get that carbon inside? So oh yeah, this, yeah, how do you get the car? Oh, you already have the carbon. Nobody right, so this, yeah. to make this max, this max phase, um, uh -huh. I'm not a ceramics person, I'm a nanomaterials person, but uh -huh. the ceramics people will, will make these kind of max phase using things like spark plasma sintering. Uh-huh. And then you remove al aluminum. Using the etching. Uh, yeah, okay. that's right. Okay. Yeah. And I guess the different uh, absorption, right? Different absorbent you put, the ligands you put on the surface, that change the that's property right. of, the, of the sheet, right? Yeah, that's what determines what kind of functional groups you actually get. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And does it change the electronic properties? Good question. There's a lot of research on that, that, that having uh -huh. OH functionality versus an F functionality uh -huh. or a chlorine functionality does uh -huh. seem like it changes the electronic properties. Um, uh -huh. So there's been a lot of work done on that. We're somewhat limited on how much we can change the surface functionality because uh -huh. we, for us, we, we need it to be dispersible in water for several reasons. But one of the reasons we have to disperse it in water is uh, it makes it really easy to separate your maxines from your parent material. You, you never see. get a hundred percent yield. So you have to separate the, the max from the nano sheets. I see. So I anyway, see. there's a lot of research yeah. still going on in that area trying to I change the functional groups. Yeah, thank yeah. you. I think we have one raising hand, but I don't yeah. know. Uh, uh, it's Swapnil. Go ahead, Swapnil. 
Yeah, please, yeah. Yeah, I'm a Professor Green. Thank you for your exciting talk. Uh, uh, to talk about oxidation, uh, it's very likely that there is this interaction of this external environment uh, with the surface of Maxine. And that external environment could be, you know, possibly oxygen, uh, oxygen and other things like you mentioned about this uh, uh, going towards high, uh, going towards alkaline pH. Now, what's the possible mechanism here? Do these reactions mm. occur or, uh, with the core of Maxine or do these reactions actually start by interacting, uh, these species interacting with the functionalities of Maxines or the surface yeah. of Maxines? Yeah, this is a good question. We have a paper that's in preparation on this exact question of how, do, how, does, how does the water interact with the Maxine and also how do antioxidants interact with the Maxine? So a couple things to know. One is that the, the functionality on the Maxine is different on the basal plane versus the edge. So for instance, like right here, I have a piece of paper. So if this is my Maxine, the functional groups you have around the edge are different than what you have here on the basal plane. And all the evidence we have seems to indicate that oxidation occurs most heavily at the edges and it eats its way inward. And um, it do, even so, it, it still seems like it's that outer layer of titanium that's being attacked, but one functional group versus another um, does make a difference. Uh, so we published a paper in ACS Applied Nanomaterials last year uh, showing that if you if you make a film, let's say you make a film of vaccine, film of vaccine. And, and then you anneal it, uh, if you anneal it, then you can remove a lot of those functional groups and it seems to be much more stable against oxidation. So the functional groups definitely aid in that oxidation process. So the primary reaction is with the core or it starts with the functional groups? So, I mean, th these things are only five atoms wide, so it's not the core, it's, it's with the surface titanium layer, but the functional groups have an impact, they, they, they do have an impact on the ability of the water to attack the titanium and make TiO2. But it is yeah, that outer layer of titanium, yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. So this wrap up our morning session. Uh, I want to thank all the speakers, all the participants for your nice work and nice presentations. So we can leave this Zoom room right now. <laughs> Have a good day. Bye-bye.